you know, machine learning, AI, and deep learning, it's not a solve-all solution for everything. It's, right. it's really about being able to identify patterns in lots of data or complex data and being able to come up with, with predictions as a result of that. Nir, how are you? Good. How are you, Michael? Fantastic. Thank you so much for joining me on 20 Minute Leaders. You know, it's already nighttime, obviously, in Israel. Uh, so even more thank you for taking the time to join me. No worries. Uh, standard working hours. <laughs> standard working hours for a, for a CEO of, a, of an early stage startup uh, that has to obviously do both U.S. and Israel. Uh, so wonderful. Uh, you know, Nir, uh, so much experience in the machine learning and artificial intelligence space, uh, research and from, and from Google, and most recently the company that you founded, Allegro. And I'd love to use these next 19 minutes or so so that I can learn a little bit about where we're headed. And, you know, a, a lot of the people that are viewing this, uh, some of them are technical, some of them are not. So uh, I'm sure we, let's try to find a balance of how can we, you know, talk about this industry at a bit higher level and what opportunities are, and what opportunities are, and what the constraints are. Sure. So tell me a little bit about Allegro, really quick, just so we can have context of what you're interested in and some of the things that you're researching. Absolutely. So, so um, <clears throat> actually, we we you know we do a little bit of research, but uh, even you know research also on team communication and building you know building models at scale. Sure. Yeah. Sure, sure, sure. I mean, research always has a, a specific connotation in AI, uh, yeah. but but you know, basically, where where we come at it, or um, uh, we're we're about engineering the research, and I'll explain. So um, you know, the thing about AI, and when I'm speaking about AI, you know, in my context, it's machine learning and deep learning, um, and uh, basically, it's a fundamentally different paradigm on how to do software, right? So traditional software is a very logical, linear development process. At, in its, at its essence, it's basically um, engineers um, building um, algorithms to solve problems and then coding them in a way that a machine understands, right? So then the machine can actually run it. Whereas in, in, in machine learning, deep learning, what you're actually doing is you're employing algorithms to come up with the algorithm to solve the problem. Right. And, right, this is, and so you do this through a process of iteration uh, and experimentation, hence machine learning. Right, so the algorithm supposedly learns, right? Yeah. Um, and so this is a very this is an experimentational process rather than uh, a standard uh, software process, and this has fundamental implications on everything else, right? On the type of talent that you need to to basically drive development and maintenance of this, on on the type of tools that you need, um, and how to integrate uh, workflows to make that work. And so uh, what we do at Allegro is we basically provide an end-to-end -end tool chain or platform, whatever you want to call it, um, that basically supports the key uh, pillars or aspects of AI around the paradigm so that our customers can focus on building uh, and maintaining their product or service um, so that they can focus in, and therefore build a better solution faster and more cost-effectively, right? So at, at the end of the day, we're about engineering the processes uh, that are specific to AI um, to, to make it uh, uh, you know, more productive. Okay, so maybe give me you know, a, a brief context and a rundown of what is the life cycle of an AI project in terms of, let's say that I now, uh, I want to take a team of three other uh, researchers and engineers. Uh, I want to solve, my problem is that, that I want to know, uh, I want to know uh, what my dog is going to think next. Okay, so I have a new puppy <laughs> and I know that he has patterns, I just don't know what they are, of when he's going to go bite the couch. Now this, and it's awful because I'm going to have to pay for this couch because this is, you know, a, a rental. Right. So, right. so how, how do, what is the life cycle of such a project from a machine, from a machine learning researcher's perspective? So actually, you, you hit actually the nail on the head, right? I mean, what, that's one thing to remember for the non-technical audience, right? Uh, you know, machine learning, AI, and deep learning, it's not a solve-all solution for everything. It's, right. it's really about being able to identify patterns 
in lots of data or complex data and being able to come up with, with predictions as a result of that, right? Yeah. So you hit the nail on the head on that. And so being able to understand when your puppy is going to, uh, to bite the couch, uh, you, you know, you'll need to collect data, right? So to basically, um, uh, you'll need to um, collect data about the puppy's behavior, right? Um, for a period of time during which uh, he may, you know, bite the couch or not, and he's just acting around, right? So basically, in this case, you're probably going to film him, right? Yeah. I mean, you could theoretically also put some sensors around them and measure other types of things uh, related to, to, to maybe his, uh, you know, level of anxiety or whatever and blood or pressure, I could right? Or him around go that the notebook and write logs of every single thing he does. Exactly, right? And then so <clears throat> basically, you know, that's the first thing you need to do. I mean, because... Uh, data, what we like to say is it's really the raw material that drive the process, right? right? Um, and, and so then what you're going to do is you're going to have to uh, basically, um, you know, you're going to have to have a data scientist or you're going to have to find someone uh, that is going to figure out, okay, what is the best, uh, you know, the best uh, way to, to, to address this or to build a, uh, a solution to, to, to predict this? And what I mean by that is you want someone to be able to, to identify what's the right algorithms. There are a lot of algorithms out there, right? In deep learning, they're called neural networks. In machine learning, there, there's a set of algorithms, right? Which is the one that's best suited to solve this problem? And there are obviously different types of algorithms, each one for different uh, uh, solutions optimized for them. And then you're going to have to build basically an experiment. You're building basically an experiment where you're saying, I'm going to take this data. I'm going to assume this is the right model for me. I'm going to tune different parameters around it. You have some, you know, think of it as a block where you can actually tune and, and change some levers. And then you're going to run an experiment and you're going to see the results. And um, I, just, I want to also, there, there is a differentiation because I think there's a misconception that anybody who says I'm a machine learning engineer or something like that, then people assume that, they, you know, they're a mathematical genius that they're sitting and they're, you know, they're creating, the, they're, they're necessarily creating these new un, unseen before algorithms. But a lot of engineers that are working on machine learning today, you have all these democratized tools like TensorFlow and PyTorch and all these, you know, out of the box tools where you can even if you don't know machine learning at all, you can say, yeah, I have this data set. I, re I heard on a podcast that this should be suitable to, you know, a logistic regression. So let's just try it out and, oh, it works or it doesn't work. It's true. I mean, so, so uh, a lot of the big, you know, cloud providers, uh, uh, namely mostly, you know, you see Google, Amazon, Microsoft, uh, um, and some others are providing tools that uh, enable, you know, people who have, you know, basic technical affinity to be able to, to do these things. Uh, but the important thing to remember, at least, you know, where I'm coming from in the industry is that these tools are lowest common denominator. They're mm -hmm. going to be able to maybe solve a problem of a puppy, but once you get into situations where, uh, you know, the, the, the precision becomes much more important because, right. you know, the cost associated with a mistake is going to be bigger. Say autonomous vehicles, right? Yep, or exactly, something yeah. else, right? Then, um, <clears throat> you know, it's not enough to have a layman using these tools. You're going to have to actually have people who are much, uh, you know, much more knowledgeable, uh, both on, you know, on different aspects of this, right? So there's a lot of aspects. There are the people who actually are going to, to use the neural networks and to do the stuff and maybe even tweak them around. And even, uh, you know, we, we're working with companies who even are, um, um, you know, smart enough to actually be able to, to, to build their own neural networks. Yeah. Uh, to then, you know, engineers who know how to actually take that and build a solution, that scalable solution, right? Um, and so, so there are many, you know, you need to have a, a lot of professionals in this process, right? So it depends. It, it, really, sounds the like the, it really sounds like the 80-20 rule where you can get, you know, 80% precision with 20% of the effort. But if you want to get 100% accuracy and you want to make sure that your autonomous vehicle is going to be predictable in these circumstances, you're going to have to put 100% of the effort and go that extra mile. Did you take a sneak peek at some of our presentations? Because <laughs> oh, no, <laughs> that's exactly I, I, right. <laughs> you, you know who I grew up with, and I've been hearing about this uh, from, from birth, basically. <laughs> yeah, it, it's, uh, it's, it's exactly that. Uh, it, you know, so, I heard somewhere, and it's so true, I mean, building a prototype, even building actually a prototype of an autonomous vehicle to, to drive in, 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 a, in, a, you know, in a parking lot is very, very easy. The problem is exactly that, to build a real product. That's exactly the 80-20 rule. Exactly. Wonderful. Okay. So, so you know, uh, Allegro, how, how is it helping either, you know, democratize um, machine learning and AI so that others can use it or make it more efficient and better for teams? How does this whole process work? Sure. So, so we basically, um, we help companies um, in three or four pillars, right? So um, the first one is what we call experiment management or process management. And this is really around how do you manage 
this different process of experiments, right? right? So you have a lot of experimentation that you're doing um, and you need to basically uh, be able to pick and choose the best one, compare them, go back and, and maybe take a different direction in your research, et cetera. So how do you actually manage that process efficiently? Uh, you know, that's one piece that we do. Uh, the second piece, uh, and I'm going really fast high level here, right? The second piece oh. is around um, this new space called MLOps, right? So it's, the AI version of DevOps, right? So in, in DevOps, in a nutshell, it's about taking a single discrete piece of code and scaling up a lot, you know, over a lot of uh, computers so that it can work in scale, right? To, to service a lot of uh, users or what have you. Whereas um, in AI, you're actually having lots of different experiments running at the same time. And so you need to have, the problem is different. You need to have uh, a way to scale up lots of slightly different pieces of code. They're, about the same, but they're slightly different, and it's a different problem. The other thing is DevOps usually happens in production. And so in standard software, there's a very clear delineation between development and production. Right. Whereas in AI, the need for a lot of compute power begins really, really early on. Yeah. As you, you know, right after you built the initial model, you're going to have to take more compute power to, to do bigger, bigger data sets. And so this is, this is the area of MLOps. And so... Uh, it's a very different problem than DevOps, and we provide a really simple solution for that so that um, uh, companies uh, who have data scientists can self-serve self themselves uh, because yeah. that's oftentimes where the problem is. They're, they're, they're going to the DevOps who don't know exactly what they need, and there's a lot of friction there. So that's the second thing that we help with. Um, the you third actually, thing... You actually uh, own the GPUs and you, ma and you manage the running, or are you... How does that actually work over there? Right. We, we don't own the GPUs um, or, or any of the underneath hardware. Um, our solution is 100% software. Okay. We basically provide uh, an orchestration and a queuing layer to enable data scientists to do this. It, it can sit directly on the hardware. It can also sit on scalable solutions like Kubernetes, which were built for DevOps, but a lot of companies who have this want to you know, to have their AI also on that. So we basically oh. have this kind of like translation layer so that the uh, data scientists can build solutions easily and it then runs and it kind of, you know, runs ultimately on Kubernetes through our system. Yep. Um, so that's, you know, that's, that's the MLOps part of it. The third pillar um, is around uh, data management. And what I mean by data management is really metadata management, right? Because it's about the insights of the data, right? When you're looking at data, think about your dog, right? The, the, the video itself is meaningless unless you basically say, okay, here's where, you know, your puppy bit the couch or here where, you know, they started starting playing around or whatever. That metadata, uh, you know, maybe it's nighttime or daytime or it's winter, right? Those are the things that are actually, you know, potentially could affect your puppy's behavior, right? Totally. And so those are the things that you need to manage. Um, and the thing is that um, you need to understand, you know, data skews and data biases because ultimately, let's take an example from, from uh, you know, autonomous vehicles. Most of the time what you're dealing with is these really rare edge cases. What happens when you're driving and the sun is exactly, uh, you know, shining through the camera and you're making a left turn and someone's coming from the right and there's a stop sign or whatever. Those, you know, those edge cases are the ones that you need to deal with right. uh, and they're rare. And so you don't have a lot of data on that. And so uh, then what happens is actually if you have too much data of something else and not enough of, of these situations, your neural network, your algorithm is not going to learn well. So okay. you have to rebalance the data, et cetera. So building a solution to do that, to really manage metadata as raw material for your process, this is something completely new. Companies like Google, Microsoft, Amazon have internal in-house solutions built for that, but 99% of the other companies don't, right? And so and it's relevant to say when almost every startup either claims or actually does, you know, work, uh, AI work, yeah. Yeah, I mean, we can, we can talk about that uh, at a different time. Uh, <laughs> but uh, that's, I mean, there's some amazing startups out there, but uh, you're right. A lot of, uh, un, un, you know, uh, unsubstantiated claims are also out there. Um, and so that's so it, it doubles your valuation within a second. So of course you do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then I guess the fourth pillar is about collaboration. And it's, it's really, it's about collaboration and actually uh, efficiency of, uh, of your human capital. So, uh, and it, this has multiple facets. So the first facet is your data scientists. Really good ones. Again, we talked about the fact that, you know, we're, we're solving problems for, you know, companies who have very high standards, you know, not your layman solutions. And so uh, getting these 
uh, you know, very uh, highly qualified research scientists and data scientists, uh, super expensive and very hard to find. Um, and so if you have them, you want to make sure that they're as productive as you can. The second thing is researchers and data scientists have a very different mindset than engineers. Yep. Because again, they're yep. doing research work. And so, but ultimately you're building a product, which is an exercise in engineering. And so there's a friction there. And the idea is how do you actually make them or how do you actually get them to integrate well into a larger product and engineering team? So <clears throat> obviously these have a lot of aspects around, you know, how do you manage it organizationally, et cetera. But it also has an aspect around tooling, right? For example, how do you make sure that you have a tool that enables a simple handoff between something that the data scientists build and an engineer can actually take and use as a containerized solution that they don't need to understand what's inside, right? So we facilitate those things uh, from that aspect so that um, on one hand, uh, data scientists can become much, much more productive, but also at the same time, be able to hand off and integrate nicely into the large organization. So those are the, um, um, I guess, four pillars of, of how we help uh, companies. Wonderful. And, and where, is it, where, is it, where is it at now? So Allegro, where, where, what's happening in, in realms of, you know, in terms of the team and, and funding, et cetera? So we're, uh, you know, we're, uh, we're a Series A company. We're about uh, 30 people. Um, you know, we, we, we're, um, <clears throat> you know, so we're, we're um, uh, an open source company. So most of our platform is, is completely open. Um, wow. And so uh, we're, we're actually undertaking what uh, Andreessen Horowitz uh, uh, calls a uh, B2B growth sales strategy. So we're, you know, we're pushing on getting a lot of companies to, to adopt our solution, uh, um, <clears throat> you know, w w and knowing that they're going to upsell into, into at some point to some enterprise solution. And so that's going well. We're, you know, I can't release numbers, but we're growing uh, really, really fast. That, that's wonderful. Okay, Anir, I have you for just a few more minutes, uh, but, sure. I, 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 but I'd, love to, I would love to pick your brain. Uh, what, what are you most passionate about in the realm of, of the AI space? And if you, like, if you think you know, five years down the line, realistically, what, what are the things that you are most excited about that I will get to experience in my 20s now? <laughs> uh, I mean, what I'm most passionate about is, is what got me here in the first place. I mean, and this is, you know, I, so I spent about a decade at Google and, and you know, after you are Google and you're doing a, a lot of uh, uh, things that really, you know, impact huge swath of humanity, really, right? It, it's, it's, you know, you, you really learn about, you want to innovate and you want to do something that's impactful. And that's really, that's been the driving force for me across my whole career. How do I actually be in, you know, innovate and push the envelope or be part of, of something that pushes it to the next stage and really be able to have a, a large impact? And, you know, I think that AI obviously is going to have a large, a huge impact on humanity in so many aspects. And so for us, it's really about making that happen. I think that there's a really big uh, disparity between where the media is today and what's actually happening. Most of the companies are struggling with this. And so to me, if you're asking realistically what we're going to see in the next several years is we're going to see a lot of the, um, you know, the things that you're already seeing out of Google, et cetera, but become standard everyday things where it's normal for you to do that, right? If it's normal for you to talk to a bot, right? That's completely automated. It's, yeah. it's it, you know, it's normal for companies to be able to automatically figure out, you know, who are the best customers and where they need to target it, right? It's, it's, it's very easy to be able to understand what you're seeing in video, et cetera, right? And, totally. and, no, you know, I, I had recently a talk with, with a product manager at Waymo and one of the very interesting things that she mentioned was, you know, the media and, and a lot of companies were very quick to, to make these, these crazy assumptions that, yeah, by the year 2020, we're going to have vehicles on the road. But, and people, uh, because people thought that it, the, the problem was a little bit, I think, easier than, than what it is. And all of a sudden, they, they got to 95% mark. And then they realized that that last sliver, which is exactly. critical. When you're talking about lives, oh, that's going to take a little bit longer. Uh, so I, I agree, and, and, I, and I definitely look forward to seeing where things progress. I'm very excited about my own studies with AI and, and, and getting a deeper understanding myself to be able to you know, harness these qualities as well. Uh, we, you know, we're, we're almost out of time, but I have to ask you my favorite question. Uh, I would love to know three words that you would best describe yourself. Very curious for that now. Yeah, so, so you warned me about this uh, right yeah. before, but I didn't have time to think about it. But, but let, me, let me tell you about, uh, so <clears throat> let me give a different answer, slightly different. When I, you know, when I look at the leaders and managers that I aspire to be like, right, uh, I, you know, I saw people who are, you know, pushing the envelope, who are uh, able to take bold decisions. I saw people who deeply care about uh, 
the success, their success within the context of the organization, not a me first, and, and also deeply care about, um, you know, who, you know, their team and the people that work for them and their success again within that context. And then at the end of the day, uh, you know, having, uh, doing everything with integrity. And so, you know, when you ask me, this is what I aspire to, to be. I love it. I love it. And, you know, I think it's just, I'm sure it's such a both fascinating, difficult and fun journey at the same time to now lead a company that's growing quickly and, and you have to now really formulate your own leadership style and, and what does it mean to be, to be a leader in that, in that aspect. And you're also, I think I recall you were a captain in the IDF as well, which I'm sure uh, has a, a lot of connections to some of the things <laughs> that you're experiencing now, uh, but, but it sounds wonderful. Nir, best of luck with Allegro. Uh, thank you for the inspiration over these last 20 minutes and I look forward to keeping in touch. Thank you so much, Michael. It's been a pleasure. Uh, all right. and, and obviously all the success to you and maybe, you know, you can come work for us or use our tools. Done. All right. <laughs> All right. Take care, Nir. Take care, Michael. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.